sons of the Lord, rise among them. Good morning and welcome. It's so good to have you. We are the Holgate Street Church of Christ. Welcome to our virtual service this morning. We're going to worship God and we're so thankful that you have decided to join us. The call to worship this morning will be from Psalms 96, the first four verses. And it reads, O sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations and his wonders among all people. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. Amen. Let's pray. Father, there is no God but you. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. You alone are worthy of all praise. You alone are worthy of our worship. All other gods are idols, but you are our Father. Bless our time together. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. There are some things I may not know. to read from John the third chapter beginning in the 16th verse and it reads for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world 
but that the world through him might be saved. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the love that you have for us, for the gifts that you have given us. We're so thankful for the gift of Christ. We're so thankful for his sacrifice. Father, for all that he did that we might be saved. Father, we thank you for this bread that reminds us of his body as it hung on the cross for us. Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine because it reminds us of the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Father, as we partake of this emblem, we ask that you would help us to remember Jesus and all that he went through for our sake. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Another part of our worship is giving back to God what, from what he has so richly blessed us with. I would like to read a few verses from 2 Corinthians 9, chapter beginning in the 6th verse. And it reads, But I say this, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the many blessings that you've given to us, have entrusted us with. Father, we want to be the kind of givers that you would have us to be. We want to be cheerful givers. Father, we ask that you bless us and that you would help us as we work on our giving. Father, we ask that you bless the offering this morning, that you would bless our use of it. Father, we thank you so much for all that you have done for us, and we want to be the kind of giver that you are. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. There are three ways that you can give this morning. The first way is through our website. You can go to wholegatecfc.com, hit the Donate tab, and enter your information there. The second way is through the Zelle app, where you can go to treasurer at wholegatecfc.com, and you can make your offering there. The third way is the P.O. box, where you can mail your check to Holgate Street Church of Christ, Box 18226, Seattle, Washington, 98118. Thank you, and may God continue to bless you. joy will be gathered with the angel chorus standing by the glassy sea such a thought is hard to fathom in the presence of my king and with countless ones forgiven gathered round the throne to sing glory and Spread. 
all the ways you reign supreme Even death can't hold the vastness Nor approach this awesome thing Cause you are God and to your glory We will worship and abide In your presence there forever We'll be happy to reside Glory and honor Worthy is the Lamb Glory and honor Oh, 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 oh. 
You know who said the rocks will cry out? You don't praise him. <laughs> Say! Come on now. Thank you for joining us today at our weekly online worship service. Appreciate you tuning in, and we're going to begin our message for this morning. And what I want to do this morning is talk about one of the most popular and familiar texts and verses in all the New Testament. And it communicates one of the most powerful promises that God has for us. 
And uh, it's also a promise that is uh, extremely comforting uh, in times of trouble. And so it's one that you know. Uh, it's one that uh, we've discussed before in various uh, occasions. But I thought it would be appropriate for us to begin this new year um, by being reminded of this promise and also uh, some of the associated concepts. So uh, what I want to do is uh, read this text. The text is Romans 8, and I want to read verses 28 through 30, and we'll look at that. And these truths will give some direction and purpose to our lives. Uh, this promise is, is a promise that will apply to all of your life or everything uh, throughout the entire year. And so again, that's why I wanted to begin with that uh, this morning. So let me read, uh, if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. I want to read verses 28 through 30. The Bible says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. For those God foreknew, He also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. So what I want to do uh, in looking at this is to talk about uh, what God wants. What God wants. Um, now what, is, what is God's will for us? And I think uh, this, uh, these verses have... Several things to say about that. What's his desire? What's his purpose? What does he want and in particular for us? And what I want to do is um, actually talk about four things that God wants, but I just want to focus on the first one because it's the foundational uh, truth and the other truths that we'll talk about next time are related to that one. So, uh, so let's look at that. Now, I want to give you a little uh, context, because uh, here we are in Romans 8, but let me talk a little bit about what leads up to uh, this, these particular verses. Uh, when we look at the uh, message of Romans, we find that the book of Romans is Paul's, um, you know, it's, his, it's his most theological uh, letter that he teaches about the, the truth of salvation. Uh, that's really the theme, and uh, it talks about you know, how we can gain access to the riches of God's grace through Jesus. And uh, what, what happens is uh, we find the key verse in chapter 1, which is verse 16, and I'll read verse 17 as well. So in Romans 1 and 16, it says, "From I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it, meaning the gospel, it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. He says, first is to the Jews and then also to the Gentiles. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And this righteousness of God is contrasted with the righteousness of man. He said, this righteousness is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So, so this is the key uh, verse, I think, that, that gives a summary of the message of this book of Romans. Now, the overall theme is salvation in Christ. And uh, what he does in chapters 1 through 3 is he talks about the need for salvation, our need for salvation. He talks about the fact that all have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. And that the wages of sin is death, uh, that, that concept, that all have sinned. And therefore, everyone is under the penalty of death, regardless of whether you're Jew or Gentile. There's no advantage of being a Jew, because Jews have sinned under the law. Gentiles have sinned outside of the law. So there's no advantage. The principle is that everyone has a need for God's salvation. Everyone is under the penalty of death, both physical death and spiritual death. So that's the message of chapters 1 through 3. And then uh, in chapters 4 and 5, what Paul does, he, he talks about the way of salvation, the fact that, that Christ died for the ungodly, and that our sin problem, 
which has separated us from God, our sin problem has been dealt with through the death of Christ. And so it's our faith and our dependence upon what God has done through Jesus on the cross is what leads us to salvation and a relationship with God through Him. So that's verses or chapters, uh, uh, both chapters 4 and 5. Now, in chapters 6 through 8 in Romans, what we find here is a description then of the life of the person that has now been declared righteous by God. How should that person live? And so in uh, chapter 6, he says in verse 11, in the same way, count yourselves as dead to sin, but alive to Jesus Christ. Uh, in chapter 7, he talks about the fact that you are now dead to the law, but you're now serving the new way of the Holy Spirit. And then now in chapter 8, uh, he says, uh, for we are no longer governed by the flesh, but rather we live by the Holy Spirit. So, so here he's talking about the, the, the person who is now justified by faith in Christ. How is that person to live? Now in verse 18, uh, Paul makes reference to uh, present sufferings. Verse 18, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that shall be revealed in us. So he, he makes reference to uh, present suffering. And then in verse 26, he makes reference to our weakness. He says in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. He says, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Now, what follows then, uh, this idea of suffering and this idea of weakness, are the thoughts that then come in uh, verse 28. Now again, I want to look at this text by looking at four things that God wants. We want to look at the first one today. And so let's look at this first one. Four things that God wants. What's, what's the first thing that God wants? Well, what we find in this verse is that God wants to work for your good. God wants to work for your good. Verse 28, it says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love Him. Now, it does not say that all things are good. It doesn't say that. Uh, uh, sickness is not good. Uh, the breakup of relationships, that's not good. Uh, financial challenges, uh, that's not good. Spiritual struggles, that's not good. So it doesn't say that all things are good uh, because we're going to experience difficulties in this life. That's, that's the nature of life. In John 16 and 33, Jesus himself said, I've said these things to you, that in me you will have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. He says, in this world, you will have tribulations. You will have difficulties. You will have trials. But again, he says, you know, don't be discouraged by that. Take heart, I've overcome the world. In Psalm 34, verse 19, a psalm of David, David says, many are the afflictions of the righteous. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. People, some people have this idea that you know, when you become a Christian, uh, uh, all of your troubles disappear. No, they don't disappear. Uh, the difference is that you've got a solution now. David says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord, the Lord himself, uh, will deliver us from them all. So we have that promise. And then Job, who of course is the classic story of human suffering, in Job 14 and verse 1, Job says, Man that is born of a woman is of a few days and full of trouble. So anyone who, who understood suffering, it would be Job. He says, we don't live that long, and the few days that we do live, those days are full of trouble. So we're going to have difficulties in this life. And this text is not saying we're not going to have them. And... Uh, 
uh, what it is saying is that in everything, including those things that are not good, in everything, God will work for good. Now, uh, that's despite what happens in our lives. You know, you've heard, you've heard the, uh, uh, the saying, if, 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 if life brings you lemons, you turn them into lemonade. And, and that's what God does. God takes our lemons and he turns them into lemonade. Uh, he takes those things that, that would seem to be stumbling blocks and he turns them into stepping stones. Uh, God takes our scars and he turns them into stars. Okay, so, so these are some, some sayings that, that communicate the fact that no matter what happens in our lives, God can make it good. We need to be convinced of that fact and that truth. And that's where faith comes in because a lot of times we can't see, you know, how is this going to work out for good? I can't see that. Well, the way we can see it is only through faith. We don't feel like it. We can't reason it. You know, when you add up everything, it doesn't seem like anything's going to happen in terms of this matter. But faith says, I believe that somehow, some way, at some point in time, God is going to work this thing out for good. Now, in verse 31, okay, which is past this text, uh, Paul makes a very uh, emphatic statement about God. And in verse 31, he says, what then shall we say in response of these things? He says, if God is for us, and, and really the proper, the proper uh, uh, translation should be since God is for us. There's no question that God is for us. So since God is for us, then who can be against us? And he, he gives evidence how much God is for us, the proof that God is for us. And he says in verse 32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give to us all things? So what's the proof? What's the evidence that God is for us? Well, it's the fact that he gave his son Jesus. That's the greatest thing he could give. And so if he's willing to do that, then, then God's willing to do everything and give us everything that we need for life. So God is, God is for us. The, uh, uh, if you back up to Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, uh, it says the same thing. But God demonstrates his own love for us. How does he do that? In this, while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. How is it that God demonstrated the fact that he wants the best for us? And that's really what love is about. He gave his son. So God is for us. God is continually working for our good. And uh, we see this throughout scripture. For example, we see this in the very beginning when God created the universe and he created mankind. In Genesis chapter 1, uh, uh, Verse 28, it talks about the fact that on the sixth day, God created man and woman. Verse 28 says, and God blessed them. He blessed them. He put them in a paradise. Uh, God gave them uh, uh, provision. And God gave them a means of being productive. Everything that they needed, God provided. In verse 31, God says, or the Bible says that God saw that all that he had made and he said that it was very good. So in, in creation, the very beginning, when God creates Adam, he creates Eve, uh, everything was good. God was working for their good. Now, uh, God's desire for working towards good is also demonstrated in the story of the people of Israel. We find that uh, the people of Israel, the nation of Israel, uh, descendants of Jacob, they are under bondage in Egypt. And they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And, and what's happening is uh, the second generation who came out of Egypt are now being prepared by God to enter into the promised land. And, and that's basically what the book of Deuteronomy is about. Deuteronomy means second law. And what happens through the book of Deuteronomy is Moses is giving the law for the second time, but he's giving it the first time he gave it for the older generation who immediately came out of Egypt. But now those individuals have died uh, uh, in the wilderness and now God is preparing 
the younger generation who came out of Egypt and those who were born while in, while in the wilderness, he's preparing those to enter into the promised land. So he gives the law for the second time. And I want you to listen to this message uh, that God gives to the people. Uh, I want to read from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And just listen, listen to uh, what God's message is to the people. So Deuteronomy 6, beginning at verse 10. Here's what the Bible says. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, He swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large flourishing cities that you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things that you did not provide, wells that you did not dig, vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied... He says, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So here God says what he's going to give to them. All of these things are good. He's going to give them a land that has flourishing cities. And he says, these are cities you didn't build them. He's going to give them houses that's filled with all kind of good things. And these good things he's saying you didn't provide those. He's going to give you wells and provide you with water. And these wells you did not dig, vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant, even to the point where you're going to eat and be satisfied. That was God's provision for good. It's another example. Now, what God can do is God can take the things in our lives that are not good and he can, he can work them together for good. Now, an example of that is in the story of Joseph. And we remember that story in the Old Testament. The story begins in Genesis chapter 37. In Genesis 37, you have this teenager, one of the sons of Jacob. Uh, he's 17 years old, and he is Jacob's favorite. And, and he demonstrates that by giving him this richly ornamented robe. Well, uh, he has these dreams of ruling over both his parents and his brothers. Well, his brothers, uh, uh, they were jealous and they hated him. And so they plotted to kill him. But rather than kill him, they sold Joseph uh, to many night servants that were traveling through the land. They were traveling to Egypt. Uh, he arrives at Egypt. He then becomes the servant of Potiphar. Uh, which is the captain of the uh, Egyptian guard. And so while he is there, he is falsely accused of assaulting Potiphar's wife. Uh, Joseph is unjustly thrown into prison because of this accusation. But over time, he interprets uh, the dreams of two of Pharaoh's servants who were also thrown into prison. And one of the servants, uh, the dream indicated that he was going to be restored to Pharaoh's service. And Joseph tells him, you know, remember me. When you get back, remember me. Uh, you know, say something on my behalf to Pharaoh. And, uh, but what happens, the servant forgets. Uh, but years later, he remembers when the Pharaoh has a dream. And he remembers there's a person in prison who interpreted his dream. And so Joseph is called to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. And as a result, uh, he is elevated to become the second most powerful person in the land. There was a famine at the time, and that was um, part of the interpretation of Pharaoh's dreams. And because of the famine and uh, because Joseph had demonstrated the fact that he was able to uh, interpret these dreams, of course, through the power of God, that he was given charge of, of uh, administering all of the, uh, the food gathering and distribution in the land. Now, over time, uh, Joseph's brothers come to Egypt for food. And when they arrive, they don't recognize him. They, of course, assume that, that Joseph is dead. But here, Joseph is this powerful man in Egypt, and they don't recognize him. Now, no, Joseph recognizes them. But they didn't recognize him. And so eventually Joseph reveals himself. Uh, it's a very moving uh, part of the story. Uh, over time, um, 
Joseph and, and the brother's father dies. So the father dies. And after the father dies, uh, the brothers are afraid. They, they become fearful because they're thinking that now that the father is gone, uh, that now Joseph is going to take his revenge. But um, uh, he chooses not to do that. And he has and makes this statement uh, to his brothers in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. Here's what he says. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, and that is the saving of many lives. <coughs> so what God did is that God turned the betrayal that Joseph experienced and everything that came after that, God took that and he turned it into something good. Now here's a second example of how God can take something bad and make it into something good. It's the, again, another familiar story. It's the story of David and Bathsheba. This story is recorded in 2 Samuel uh, chapters 11 and 12. David is the king of Israel. Uh, it's, it's the springtime, and the Bible says that's when, you know, armies go to war. And David was a warrior, but here at this time, uh, he's at home. Okay, the, the army's out there fighting on his behalf, and so he's there at home. And so one night, he goes up on his roof, and he sees this woman bathing. Uh, and he's, he's struck. And so he sends someone out to find out, you know, who is this beautiful woman? And so the word comes back to David that, that she is uh, Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. Now, Uriah was one of the soldiers in David's army. He's off to war. And so David uh, uh, sends his messengers to get Bathsheba. And of course, he's the king. You know, you, you can't defy the king without, without punishment. So she comes. And uh, he sleeps with her. He's, she's married. Soldier. But it didn't matter to him. He sleeps with her. And then word comes back to David that she's pregnant. It's like, okay, what am I going to do? Uh, well, what David does is he, he schemes to cover this up. And so he sends word to Joab. Joab is, again, a leader in his, in his army. So he sends a message to Joab uh, to have Uriah to come home. And, of course, uh, David expects Uriah then to sleep with Bathsheba, and then everyone would think that this is Uriah's child. Well, Uriah uh, comes home. Uh, uh, but he doesn't go to his house. And here's what he says to David. He says, uh, and uh, this is 2 Samuel 11, uh, verse 11. He says, he says, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in tents. And my commander Joab and my Lord's men are encamped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? Surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. This is what Uriah then says to David. You know, what a committed soldier. You know, you know my fellow soldiers are out, you know, fighting. You know, they're, they're suffering in the field. So who am I to come home and sleep with my wife? He says, I'm not going to do that. So Uriah remains in Jerusalem. And so, you know, David's first Plan. plan A didn't work, so he's got to have a plan B. So plan B, David invites Uriah over, and they drink. And uh, uh, David gets Uriah drunk. Now, of course, David was thinking, okay, now you know, he's, full of, he's full of wine. Um, his reasonable faculties are relaxed. So now you know, he's going to go into his wife. Uh, but he doesn't. And so what Uriah does 
is he sleeps on a mat among the servants. Well, uh, plan A didn't work of David. Plan B didn't work. Okay, so here was plan C. Plan C uh, was extremely diabolical. What David does is he writes a letter to Joab. And he gives this letter to Uriah to take back to the battle. And this letter that Uriah is taking back to the battle is his own death warrant. Because the letter, and again, letters when they were written, they were sealed. So you couldn't open, couldn't open them and see what's inside. So in this letter, David writes to Jacob, or to Joab, he writes to Joab, and he tells him to put Uriah in the front of the battle where, where the fighting was the fiercest and, and then withdraw the troops so that Uriah would be left out front to die. That was the letter that Uriah took to Joab. And so Joab obeys. He does this. And Uriah dies. And Joab sends an account to David. And uh, Bathsheba gets word of the death of her husband. And she mourns. And after the period of mourning, the Bible uh, uh, says that David brings Bathsheba to his house. And she becomes his wife. And then she bears this son. Now, I want you to hear uh, uh, God's perspective on what has happened. In 2 Samuel 11, it's verse 27. Here's what the Bible says. It says, But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Now, that's a, that's a very strong statement. And of course... David had committed adultery. David had committed murder. He had tried to cover it up. He had, he had never acknowledged any wrongdoing. This was bad. This was bad. Well, fast forward in the story. Uh, God sends the prophet Nathan to David to confront him. And ultimately, David repents. Now, keep in mind, um, uh, Bathsheba had given birth to this child. And so, after Nathan leaves, the child becomes ill. As a matter of fact, one of the most puzzling texts in all of Scripture is the idea that God had struck this child. Well, you know, what's that about? I'm not going to examine that here. But the child becomes ill, and, and David... He fasts and he prays so that this child might be healed. But the Bible says on the seventh day, the child dies. And what happens is David accepts the death of his son. And I want you to listen to here. This is what he says, verse 22. He says, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. I, and I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me and let the child live. But now that he is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. The Bible then says David comforted his wife Bathsheba. And then Bathsheba became pregnant again. Now I want you to watch this. This son that Bathsheba gives birth to was none other than Solomon. Solomon. And God steps in here. And, and, and Solomon, you know, becomes the wisest man ever lived, of course, outside of Jesus. He becomes a great king. So God works this thing out, that, that something good could come out of this, uh, this terrible thing that David had done. And that's what he does. God works for our good, but we need to understand that, that when God does this, it's, it's not just for our good. Because when God does things for our good, it's also for His good. When He does 
things for our benefit, God benefits. Now this is demonstrated in a dialogue that Moses has with God. This is back in Numbers 14. If you remember the story that we talked about um, when uh, they were going to go in the promised land and God told Moses to send 12 spies, they come back and um, you know, 10 of the spies says, we can't go into the land, didn't have the faith. Two, Joshua and Caleb says, we can, but the people rebelled and believed the 10 and, and therefore they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years as a result. But, but listen to this um, in Numbers 14. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, things got so bad that the people wanted to stone Moses and the other leaders. That's how, that's how convicted they were. But here's, here's Numbers 14, verse 11 and following. The Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? And they were treating God with contempt because of their lack of faith. How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the signs that I've performed among them? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them, but I will make you into a nation greater and stronger than they. So God was saying, uh, I'm going to strike them down, but yet my people will survive through you. Uh, it's almost like you know, Noah, in the story of Noah. You know, people were so evil. Um, that God destroyed the world, but he preserved mankind through Noah and his family. In a sense, God was communicating this to Moses. But here was Moses' response. And, and this, again, is, is so interesting. Um, verse 13, Moses says to the Lord, When the Egyptians will hear about it, by your power you brought these people up from among them. And they will tell the inhabitants of this land about it. They have already heard that you, Lord, are with these people and that you, Lord, have been seen face to face and your cloud stays over them and that you're before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you put all of these people to death, leaving none alive, the nations who have heard about this report will say, the Lord was not able to bring these people into the land that he promised them on oath. So he slaughtered them in the wilderness. In other words, Moses was saying to God, God, if, if you destroy all the people, that's going to give you some bad press. Because the, the people have, have heard about what you've done and how powerful that you are and, and how... Uh, how you're committed to your covenant and your protection over them. If you kill them, then they'll say the Lord was not able to bring them through. So, uh, so of course, we, you know, we know God's plan. But, but the principle is, Moses was saying, when you do good to the people, then people are going to think well of you. They must be serving a great God, because just look at how God has blessed them. That's the, that's the principle. So, so when God works for, for our good, he's really working for his good as well. Uh, Jesus put it this way, John 14, uh, verse 13. He says, and whatever you do and ask in my name, I will do it. Jesus said, I will do it. You ask in my name, I will do it. Why? So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You ask me for anything in my name, I'll do it. Why? Again, when, when, when our prayers are answered by God, God is glorified. It, it's kind of like when children do well. What happens? The parents get the credit, right? Parents get the credit. Um, so in the same way, when, when God does good and works for our good, he's working for his good. So that's, that's the first promise. Now let me close with just a couple of, of final insights about this promise, because there's a couple other things that are, that are stated just in verse 28. The Bible says, and we know that God causes all things now. In the, uh, the New International Version, it doesn't mention the word together, but the word together is key to understanding another aspect of God's promise. 
In the New American Standard Bible, this is how it's translated. The same verse is translated. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. He says God causes all things to work together. Now this, this, this phrase, work together, uh, is a Greek term. Of course, we know the, the New Testament is written in the Greek language. And that term that's translated, work together, is the word from which we get our English word synergy. Synergy. Now, what, what is synergy? It describes the interaction of two or more uh, uh, substances or elements. It's the interaction. And when you combine the action of these two, the outcome, the effect is greater than the sum of if they were acting separately. Let me illustrate. Let's say that you can, you can lift 50 pounds. Okay? And let's say that I can lift 50 pounds. Now, if you count that separately, that's a total of what? 100 pounds. So you can lift 50, I can lift 50. 100 pounds total. Now, if we were to lift something together, we could lift 200 pounds. See, by working together, we can do more than if we work separately. That, that's the idea of synergy. Okay? Two or more things working together that's going to create something greater than both individually. Now, here's how it relates spiritually. Uh, God causes all things to work together for good. God can cause the good to work for good. And God can cause the bad to work together for good. But what God does is God takes the good and the bad and he puts them together and it comes out to be something better than either thing separately. That's what he does. The last thing I want you to, to realize about this, again, that's stated in verse 28 is the fact that, that we need to be sure and confident and certain about this promise. Again, if you look back at the verse in verse 28, it says, And we know. And we know that in all things God works together for the good of those who love Him. We know this. It's an expression of certainty. Now there's some things that we, even as Christians, we don't know. Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 24 and verse 42, he said, keep watch because you don't know the day on which the Lord will come. We don't know that. Uh, in Genesis 27 and verse 2, Isaac says, I am now an old man and I don't know the day of my death. Again, we don't know that. We don't know that. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 13 and 9, Paul says that we know in part. In other words, we don't know everything. Uh, and then finally, in Ecclesiastes 9, verses 11 and 12, listen to this. He says, I've seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor there's food come to the wise, nor wealth to the brilliant, or favor to the learned, but time and chance happen to them all. He says, moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil, evil times that fall unexpectedly on them. Uh, the writer was saying, we don't know everything and we don't know what's going to happen to us, in particular, when things bad happen to us. I mean, who, who, who projected this pandemic? Nobody projected that. No one knew. It happened. So there's things we don't know. That's my point. But Paul says, if you're a Christian, there's some things that you do know, some things that you can have absolute certainty about. And one of those is the fact that God will continue to work everything together for your good. You can know that. And so as we begin this year, we begin with this promise that has a purpose. God is constantly working for your good. 
His good, your good. And whatever happens in your life, good or bad, God will bring it together for something great. So next week, uh, we'll continue and, and uh, conclude our thoughts in the remaining verses uh, of this passage, 28 through Romans 8, 28 through, through 30. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for your word, and we thank you for your promises, especially this promise that you'll work for our good. We pray that we can affirm that promise and believe it and live by faith because we know you love us. We pray this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. I want to remind you that at 1215, we have our online uh, virtual Bible class for children. We call it Kids Talk. It's at 1215. Just go to the uh, website, holgatecoc.com, and click on the link for that. And also, we would like to invite you to our uh, virtual uh, prayer and encouragement. That's at 5 o'clock this, this afternoon. Again, go to the website and click on the link and join us. We'll pray for you live and, and give you words of encouragement. Also, if you're in our area in Seattle, we are meeting in person for worship. We meet at 9 o'clock. We have a Bible class at, at 9. And then we have our worship assembly at 10. And we're uh, typically done by 1115. So we hope that you can join us. And if you have any questions about the gospel of Christ, um, if you want to be a Christian, interested in, in baptism or a, a personal Bible study, uh, we will arrange that for you. Uh, just write us, email us at contact us at holgatecoc.com. Again, that's contact us at holgatecoc.com. Have a great week and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for joining us on our recorded worship today. I hope it was a blessing for you. And I want to mention that if you do have an interest in knowing more about the Lord or progressing in terms of your spiritual walk, we're here to assist you with that. If you have a desire for a Bible study, uh, if you're interested in be being baptized, uh, growing in your spiritual life, please contact us at contact us at holgatecoc.com. Again, that's contact us at holgatecoc.com. And if you do live in the Seattle area, we are having in-person live worship every Lord's Day at 10 o'clock. Uh, we'd love for you to join us there. In the meantime, have a great day and a great week.